This series wouldn't be right if I didn't mention James' wife Catherine, the Lone Wanderer's mother, would it? Not much is really known about Catherine, and I believe this makes her the perfect subject for one of these videos. One thing that is certain about Catherine, however, is that she's a good character. How am I certain, you ask? Because she drops an ear upon death. Seriously, if you have to contract Killer Park, then use commands to spawn her in, and then you kill her, she will drop an ear. Bet you're glad you tuned into this one. Catherine was a scientist and the wife of James. Together, Catherine and James worked on Project Purity, which was an attempt to produce purified water in mass quantities, all in order to overcome the critical shortage of this essential good in the capital wasteland. Man, I thought it was bad when we ran out of toilet paper during COVID. Despite intense efforts, the project was cut short when Catherine died after giving birth to the Lone Wanderer in 2258. Although appearing only briefly, Catherine's memory is the driving force behind James' second attempt to restart Project Purity, which sets in motion the storyline in Fallout 3. We are introduced to Project Purity and Revelation 21.6 very early in the game thanks to Catherine. I'm sure you guys remember that revelation at the start of the game, right? You weren't too busy bashing your dad's head in with a new cola truck or flinging toys across a room like a spoiled little brat, were you? Little is known about Catherine's background or origins. She was a dedicated scientist familiar with the Bible and Christianity. Her favorite passage being of Revelation 21.6, which we all have ingrained in our heads now. Instead of me reading all of these things out for you guys, I'll let another fellow Irishman, Mr. Neeson, read this for you. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. This passage inspired her life's work on Project Purity. Together with James, they attempted to bring the waters of life to the capital wasteland and restore it. Catherine was originally one of the several scientists working on this project, eventually falling in love with James and marrying him as stated in the Fallout 3 official game guide. I mean, how couldn't you fall in love with Liam Neeson? I'm not being biased or anything, but look at that man. Stallion. Catherine brought with herself not just knowledge, but also beauty and a spectacular passion for life and love. Their shared vision was a wasteland with unlimited access to clean, free water, safe to drink and water crops with, an opportunity to eliminate radiation, sickness and mutation to assure survival for everybody. Personally, I find that dream offensive. Without mutation, we would have no centaurs. You know those cute little wasteland puppers? And without centaurs, we wouldn't have Moira's Wasteland Survival Guide. You know, actually, Project Purity probably is a good thing when I think about it. A fun fact about Catherine is that she was actually subscribed to this YouTube channel, and you can be too, by just hitting that big red subscribe button. James and Catherine's passion and vision inspired others. Most notably, of course, Madison Lee of the Rivet City Science crew, who joined Project Purity to help figure out the issue of water purification. While they were focused on work, James and Catherine left some time for, you know, jumping bones. Knocking boots, two-person push-ups, wet in the willy, dip in the wick, riding the bony expre- Okay, okay, I think, I think you get the point. Proof of James and Catherine's shenanigans can be seen in the Better Days tape. This tape has Catherine recording her stats on a project while being distracted by James. Ironically enough, she was in the middle of installing radiation filters in the control room when she was playfully interrupted by James. Radiation filters which the Lone Wanderer must repair during the storyline. James really seemed fond of interrupting his wife at work. And during one such session of two people push-ups, the Lone Wanderer was conceived. He's ugly! Ugly! The eventual onset of pregnancy symptoms coincided with a return to work at the Jefferson Memorial after sentry guns broke down. After weeks of delays, James finally secured the support of Owen Lyons in the form of protection and technical support to hold the mutants at bay. So this explains how Madison Lee knew Lyons when the Lone Wanderer and her team showed up at the Citadel. Although we all really know that Lee and Lyons knew each other from their secret love affair. With this new protection from Lyons, the team returned to work. But Catherine's state slowed work down, briefly leading to disagreements. However, when news of her pregnancy broke, it actually had the opposite effect. It had reinvigorated the team, lifting everyone's spirits and bringing a renewed push towards making the purifier work. While their methods were inefficient, James believed they were on the right track. Catherine agreed and spent her every waking hour in the lab trying to resolve the power issues. I mean, the Lone Wanderer really was something special because within the course of 30 minutes, we went in there and fixed every single thing up. Maybe Catherine had a low repair skill. Or a high charisma skill and her and James just kept having sex. You know, I'm really surprised the Lone Wanderer is an only child. Which we'll get to later, of course. Catherine was the happiest James had ever seen her while expecting, planning great things for their future child. Little did she know what a lone wanderer would become. 
However, as months passed and the team prepared to scale back their efforts after the child was born, problems started to manifest. Catherine and James's team could not provide concrete results they hoped for, which strained relationships with the Elder. Intensifying mutant attacks and resulting casualties rendered further support uncertain. The project imploded shortly afterwards. Without Catherine, James could not properly care for an infant at the memorial's facilities. And to make things worse, work hit a dead end and mutant attacks intensified to the point the memorial came under attack several times a day. Reluctantly, James abandoned Project Purity and made for Vault 101. The rest of the team, many of whom devoted their entire lives to Project Purity, saw it as betrayal and abandonment, forcing them to walk away from the project. James never really stopped working on Project Purity, even while in the vault. This can be seen in the Project Purity personal journal, entry number 5, where James says the following. Even in Vault 101, my work on Project Purity never really stopped. Soon after we arrived, my nightly routine included sneaking into the restricted areas, searching for... I don't know, whatever I could find. It was a vault facility after all. The place was built with some of the most advanced technology this country had ever developed. Those excursions never turned up anything particularly useful. So one night after half a bottle of scotch, I broke into the overseer's office. It was easy enough to hack his console, gain access to the restricted files. Most of it was garbage, propaganda, spy reports, just plain rambling bullshit really. But there was one thing, one name that stood out amongst all the others. Dr. Stanislaus Braun. I knew of Braun's work, of course. He was a celebrity in his day, Voltex sorcerer scientist, leaving his peers in awe of his technological wizardry. But it was in Vault 101 that night in the overseer's office I first learned of Braun's involvement in Vault Tech's social preservation program and his work on something called Gek, the Garden of Eden creation kit. You know, hearing these logs when I was doing research for this video just gives me a lot more respect for James. You could build an entire DLC or even a full game around his time working in Project Purity. Getting into the vault, sneaking around, hacking shit and drinking scotch, I'd, I'd buy that. So, with this new information in mind, James of course abandoned the vault's confines to see Project Purity through to the end, all in Catherine's name. It was the only thing of value left in his life, as he assumed his child was safely sealed within Vault 101. And we were, just not safely. We were actually blasting our way through the vault in our escape speedrun. Now, of course, we all know how the rest of the story goes from here, and that really does conclude Catherine's involvement for the most part. A notable appearance of Catherine, however, is during the DLC Point Lookout. While the lone wanderers intoxicated from the punga fruit, they come across large bobbleheads, strange hallucinations, and of course, a skeleton on a medical examination table, which is labelled Mum. Pretty grim. However, Bethesda being Bethesda, they added a little bit of comedy to it, and one of the bobbleheads on the table will read, Blech, if my kid looked like that, I'd abandon it too. That's a bit harsh, Bethesda, I thought my character looked pretty good, to be honest. Another neat little fact is that you can actually see Catherine's default model during the intro cutscene on PC using console commands. Catherine's character model, similar to James, will always be the same regardless of what race or tone is used. As well as a character model, a photograph of Catherine and James was also created for the game but never placed anywhere in most editions. It was subsequently recycled in Fallout New Vegas and placed in Vault 21 in Sarah's bedroom. Maybe the Lone Wanderer wasn't an only child. That concludes our episode featuring Catherine, and it's really strange only saying her first name in this entire video. If you guys think I missed any information on her, do let me know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this video or learned anything new, give it a thumbs up, and if you didn't enjoy it or learn anything new, give it a thumbs down. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode of Behind the Character. Until next time. Mm -hmm.